I, I, look, I know, I know I'm a big geek, but man, I've been looking forward to today since October, right? Because dinosaurs are awesome. I mean, I remember the first time I watched Jurassic Park. I was probably like eight or nine years old, totally terrified me. That's a really scary movie for a kid, but it was awesome at the same time. I mean, this moment here, you know this moment, right? This is like iconic cinematography, movie moment. Man, my jaw just dropped in this moment. They saw the Brachiosaurus for the first time, right? So epic in that moment. Or, or, or what about the Dilophosaurus, the guy with the, the neck thing, the, the, the frills, and he spits the, like, the poison? Like, I was like, as a little kid, I was like, that is so cool. And then I was really disappointed. I don't know if any of you know this, but that's totally fake. And I don't mean like it's, obviously it's fake. It's a, it's a movie about living dinosaurs right now. But uh, like the Dilophosaurus didn't have neck frills, like didn't spit poison. I was so disappointed. I was like, that is the coolest dinosaur ever, and it's fake? I was so upset. But the big question I have for you today is whose team are you on? Are you team T-Rex or are you team Raptor? Come on, this is my people, right? I am Team Raptor all day, every day, right? Give me small and agile and smart over big and dumb and blind any day. Come on, it's all about the Raptors. I know I'm talking about Jurassic Park a lot, but actually this Wednesday night, we have our first Wednesday of the summer. And if you know the, the three summer months, we do kind of a, a, a little bit of a unique first Wednesday, a little bit more of a social gathering. And this Wednesday, we're going to have a movie night in the parking lot right out there, and we're going to watch Jurassic World, okay? Not Jurassic Park, but Jurassic World, because there's a new Jurassic World coming out, like, this weekend, right? And if you didn't know that, you're welcome, um, <laughs> because dinosaurs are awesome. We're going to get started right around, like, 745 with some s'mores, and then right at sunset, we'll start the movie. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, but bring your own lawn chair uh, so that you'll be comfortable, and maybe a blanket, because, I don't know, it might get cold at night. I don't know. Just be prepared. Also, we, I am editing the movie slightly, but keep in mind it is a movie about dinosaurs, and they may eat people. So, like, you just keep that in mind when you bring your children. Uh, but, yeah, I'll let parents do the, the discussion on that. Okay, why am I talking about Jurassic Park? Why am I talking about dinosaurs? Why, what is Dinosaur Day? Well, to catch you up, if you haven't been here, we're in a series. This is actually the closing message of a series. What does the Bible say about? And then we've let you guys kind of fill in the blanks. And so back in October, when we were mapping out this series, I think it was our creative director floated the idea of what if we did a message on what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? And in that moment, I called dibs. <laughs> I have never called dibs in a, of a sermon before. I don't even think that's legal, but I did it anyways uh, because I said, yes, without a doubt, absolutely, we are doing what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? And I am preaching on Dino Day. And nobody objected. Nobody objected. They're like, okay, I guess Brent's doing Dino Day. I was so excited. And then I ran into a little bit of a problem. Okay? I open up my Bible, as one does when preparing for a sermon. And I started looking through my Bible for the word dinosaur. And I ran across just, I mean, just like a slight hiccup. Maybe like just a tiny little problem, and that's that the word dinosaur is not in your Bible anywhere, which is kind of a problem if you're doing a message about what does the Bible say about dinosaurs. But I wasn't going to let that stop me, so I, I dug a little bit deeper, and I, I discovered that, well, obviously it doesn't have the word dinosaur in it, because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841 by Richard Owen, who put together two Greek words, danos, meaning terrible, and saros, meaning lizard. So it wasn't until 1841 that we even had the word dinosaur. How many of you know the Bible was written a little bit before 1841? <laughs> it was translated into English a little bit before 1841. And so obviously the word dinosaur is not going to be in there. But again, I wasn't going to let that stop me. Such a minor thing that the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs. I wasn't going to let that stop me. So we kind of came up with this idea for Dino Day. We would actually do a message about how do we approach things that the Bible doesn't really talk about directly? And we're still going to do that a little bit today, but I kept digging because I was not satisfied. As a dinosaur lover, I was not satisfied. 
And here's what I discovered, that the idea that the Bible says nothing about dinosaurs is actually hotly debated amongst Christians and scholars and people with PhDs and doctorates and that have their own schools and classes. And, and I sat there and I watched hours upon hours of hours of debates between Christians arguing whether or not there are dinosaurs in the Bible. All because there's this one Hebrew word the word is tanin. And remember, the, the Old Testament was first written in Hebrew, and this word tanin is found in the Old Testament 28 times, and it's most often translated as this word dragon, sometimes serpent, sometimes whale, and I think one time as sea monster. 28 times, though, this word tanin is found. And you could look at that and say, Okay, he's talking about, like, the demonic. Maybe it's a reference to Satan. Maybe it's just a, a generic term for, like, something scary. Or you could look at some of these uses of the word tanin and go, look, bro, that's a dinosaur. Like, that's straight up Jurassic Park. <laughs> and then it gets more complicated from there because in the book of Job, which I'm actually reading through right now, ironically, um, there's this word leviathan, which talks about a sea monster, and the word behemoth, which talks about this land beast, this great beast that eats grass and has a tail like a cedar tree. And I'm looking at that description, and I'm like, bro, that's a brachiosaurus. Like, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a straight up dinosaur. But it doesn't say that it's a dinosaur. It's just kind of like, it's kind of implied that, that, that maybe it is. So, so what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? <laughs> maybe nothing. <laughs> maybe like a bunch of stuff. And honestly, I don't know. <laughs> like, can I just be honest and say, like, as a pastor, like, I don't, I don't know what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Because there are people way smarter than me that still argue about whether or not the Bible says anything about dinosaurs. And, and I, was, I was a little bit bothered with the idea that why are so many Christians investing so much time arguing about dinosaurs? And that's when I discovered that this is used in, the ar in a bigger argument. Okay? The, the, the dinosaur argument is really, it's just like sub-point B of the argument between young earthers and old earthers. To say, how old is the earth? Is it, is it a young earth or is it an old earth? And both sides will reference dinosaurs and either their inclusion in the Bible or their exclusion from the Bible as evidence for why their point is correct. And so you've got young earthers who will take the Bible and take scripture and say creation was a literal seven-day event and the genealogies are complete and they're whole and they're not missing anybody. And so we have the ages of a lot of those people. And so we can determine that the earth is between 6,000 and 10,000 years old according to scripture. And then you have old earthers that will take the same Bible. We have a problem, right? They take the same Bible and find scriptures that say, no, no, no. The, the seven-day creation is, is not a literal seven days. It was a figurative of seven days because there's also another passage in the Bible that says to God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And then they say that actually there's this weird thing in, in Jewish culture where it was totally fine, like in the genealogies, that's the begats, like so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. Well, apparently it's totally okay in the Jewish tradition to like skip a generation and still use a begat there. So like... Like, Jewish tradition would be okay with it saying, Pastor Jerry begat Jaden, but Jaden's my kid, but they're okay just skipping me because I'm not important. <laughs> so the old earthers will take all of that and say, according to scripture, we have no idea how old the earth is. So if scientists say through carbon dating and everything else that they do that the earth is about 4.6 billion years old, we have no biblical reason to argue against that. So... That brings us to a very important question. Who's right? Who's right? Are there dinosaurs in the Bible or not? Is the earth young or is the earth old? And my answer for you today is going to disappoint a lot of you. Because the answer to the question, are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Is the earth 7,000 years old or 4.6 billion years old? according to scripture, and the answer is, according to scripture, it doesn't matter. It, just, it doesn't matter for one simple reason. It's not in the scope of the document. The 
Bible doesn't really talk about dinosaurs or how old the earth is or the Great Wall of China or space travel or the internet or even video games because from Genesis all the way through the maps, the theme of the Bible, the purpose of the Bible is to tell the story of redemption. In fact, that's what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15. He says, you have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Christ Jesus. That is the point of the Bible. It's not to use as an argument for science. It is there so that we can receive salvation. The Bible gives us a broad overview of a creation event inspired by God, done by God. And then it follows a bloodline, one bloodline, one family, all the way through to a Messiah all the while pointing out how much we are in need of that Messiah and how we can receive salvation through that Messiah. That's the point of the Bible, and we need to stop trying to use the Bible to prove things that it's not trying to prove. I'm getting kind of passionate about this because Satan would love it if we would become divided over or obsessed with an issue that just doesn't matter. Instead of allowing us to focus on the stuff that really does matter. And as Christians, we got to stop arguing so much about stuff that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And spend more time focusing on the stuff that does matter. And so, what, Brent, is the stuff that really matters? I'm, that's a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked it. Thank you for that. So, here's what we're going to do. This is going to get a little heady on you, but bear with me. We'll get back to dinosaurs in a second. This is how I learned it as a young adult. Okay, if you take a, a, a target, like a bullseye, and this is, this is how we approach Scripture and the Christian faith and everything that we believe, at the very center of the bullseye, right? That's the target you're trying to hit. At the very center are what we would describe as the absolutes of Scripture. Absolutes are the heaven and hell issues, And if you don't have agreement on the absolutes, then you are, in fact, not a Christian. Okay, and I'm not saying that to be mean. It's just just truth, okay? Because the stuff that we find in the absolutes is what defines a Christian as a Christian. Okay? And I'm going to give you five absolutes in just a moment. But first, we've got to fill in the rest of the target, okay? Because outside of the absolutes is what we would call interpretations. And that's when you take a passage of Scripture and you you interpret it. You say, I think this passage means. And there's a lot of interpretation in the Bible. In our our walk with Jesus, there is a lot that is left up for interpretation. Why? Because it was written in Hebrew and Greek, and there's a nuance to the words as they're translated into English. It can mean this thing. It can mean that thing. there's, There's different writing styles. Right? So is this, and and they don't normally have like a neon sign that tells you in advance what kind of writing style it is. So so are you reading a parable or are you reading a factual event? Are you reading poetry or should you be reading something, taking it literally? Right? Is this a prophecy about something that happened in a hundred years? Something that happened in a thousand years? Something that still hasn't happened yet? And it's left up to interpretation. I think this scripture means dinosaurs would fall into the interpretations. And yet there's some Christians that try and make it an absolute. That's crazy to me. It's an interpretation. We're saying this word tanin could mean dinosaur. Outside of that is deductions. So I'm just getting a little heady. Bear with me. Deductions are when we take Scripture A plus Scripture B and we come to conclusion C. Right? We say like, hey, there's this passage in the Old Testament, and there's this passage in the New Testament, and if you put them together, man, there's a, there's a really cool principle there. Or we take this, this thing that Paul said to one church, and this thing that Paul said to this other church, and when you put those together, it's like, wow, it shines this light on us in humanity. It's really interesting. And let me tell you, there is absolutely nothing wrong with deductions. Some of the most interesting sermons that I've ever heard were based on deductions and it's like man i would have never put those things together that is really interesting there's nothing wrong with deductions unless you're bad at math okay and if you take a bad interpretation of scripture and you add it to a bad interpretation of scripture you're left with a really bad deduction and it can be troublesome (laughs) how old the earth is would be a deduction right 
In Genesis, we have a seven-day creation, but there's another passage that says a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. You add those two together, and you say, we don't know how old the earth is. It's a deduction. And then outside of that is a bunch of other stuff, these quadrants of opinions and feelings, cultural norms and preferences, and all of this stuff on the outer ring. Uh, this is honestly what most Christians will base their church membership on. It's, do I like how I feel when I go to that church? Do, does the music fit my style? Does the pastor make me laugh? You know, does the lobby have dinosaurs in it or not? It's, it's personal preferences and feelings and, and all of that. Uh, the sad thing, though, is while this is why uh, most people will choose their church, this is also the stuff that causes most churches to split. Right? We don't split over, like, major important stuff. Like, I literally heard of a church that split over whether or not to put a hat rack in the lobby. There was a church, I think this one actually took place in Indiana, there was a church where the, the pastor's wife slapped the deacon's wife because they were having an argument about whether or not to put gutters outside of the church building or not. There have literally been churches that have split over the color of the carpet. Like, this is crazy, okay? And what we have to understand, the reason why I'm teaching you all this is all of these things are great. There are some major important stuff. There are some stuff that defines CLC as Christian Life Center. That, that falls outside of those absolutes. This is important stuff, but not all of it carries the same weight. And we cannot allow a preference to become an absolute. There are some people that say, I love the King James Version, and if a preacher doesn't preach from the King James, then he isn't saved. They took a preference, not even a deduction or interpretation. They took a preference and turned it into a heaven and hell issue. And that is a problem. This right here is what makes us Christian. This is what makes us CLC. Okay, now let me give you those five absolutes. I'm going to go through these quick. You might want to snap a picture of these. They are in your app in the notes. We believe about God that there is only one God who ex eternally exists as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, each fully and equally God. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. That means he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and he's everywhere. And God is perfect, he is holy, he is good, and he is just. We've got to have unity on this statement. If, if there's anything in this that you disagree with, then I can officially say, you're not a Christian, and I would love for you to become one. This is an absolute. It's a heaven and hell issue. The Bible, we believe that the primary way God has revealed himself to humanity is through his word, the Bible. God spoke directly to and through people who then wrote and maintained the scriptures we find in the Bible today. And if you're trying to add something to the Bible or take something out of the Bible, then you are in fact not a Christian. Not to throw anybody under the bus, but the Mormon church, this is one of the main reasons why they are not considered Christians. Because they have taken things and taken them out of the Bible, they've changed scriptures, they've tried to add things to the Bible, they've tried to create new documents that are as valuable as the, the Bible to them, and so the LDS is not Christian. In fact, we started this series with a quote that says, when it comes to understanding the creator of the universe, you can have either speculation or revelation. Either he speaks or we guess. And the Bible is how we believe God has spoken to us. Number three, sin. We believe that all people are separated from God by sin, and sin is anything that we do that falls short of God's standard. Sin separates us from our loving and holy God. The Bible also tells us that the consequence of our sin is death. And there's a progressive movement in Christianity right now that is actually not Christian because it's trying to say everybody goes to heaven, there is no problem of sin anymore. And that's not biblical, that's not it goes against an absolute. If you go to a church that teaches that, it might be a church, but it ain't a Christian church because this is an absolute. Number four, Jesus. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. He existed from the beginning with God. He is both fully God and fully human. Born of a virgin, he lived a perfect life during his 33 years on earth and was crucified to forgive the sins of those who trust in him by paying the debt we owed and was raised back to life on the third day. This is an absolute. In fact, you can believe a lot of stuff about God, but if you don't believe this about Jesus, you're not a Christian, you're probably a Muslim. 
Number five, salvation. We believe that trusting and accepting Jesus' free gift of forgiveness for us is the only way to reconcile our broken relationship with God. The second we believe, trust, and commit to following Jesus, all of our sins are forgiven and we are saved. And this salvation is available to us through faith alone and not our works. And this is an absolute, based on Scripture, salvation is a free gift. And if there's a pastor that ever tells you you got to do something to earn salvation, it is no longer Christian because it breaks the absolute. So these five things, these are the absolute. These are the things that we need to take seriously. These are the absolute heaven and hell issues that we should fight over, that we should hold strong to, that we should leave no room for negotiation. We can have no room for disagreement on these five things. The great thing, though, is with all this other stuff, we can disagree. You know, we we can disagree with the church down the street, and, and when we get to heaven, we can find out which one of us is right and still hang out in heaven together. As long as we line up on the absolutes. So, when you take communion, should you do it once a year, once a month, every time you gather? Uh, When you take communion, should you use wine or grape juice? Is Gatorade okay for communion? Uh, Should there be women in ministry or not? Should we speak in tongues? Are miracles for today, or is that just a Bible thing? Is it okay to have jokes in your sermon? Should there be electric guitars on the stage? Are lights and haze better than a hymn book and an organist? A pastor in jeans and a Jurassic Park t-shirt, or do you prefer a pastor in robes with a sweat rag? Pre-trib versus post-trib rapture. Young earth versus old earth. Are there dinosaurs in the Bible or not? We can disagree about all of that stuff and still hang out in heaven as long as we get the absolutes right. (laughs) All right. I know that's not what you expected to get on Dinosaur Day, but I did start off by saying there there was a question that we wanted to answer of, you know, how do you approach things that the the Bible doesn't really talk about directly? And and I want to use the the rest of our maybe 15 minutes together to kind of answer this question as, as best as I can. When, when you're going through something and you're like, I just, I need to know if this is okay, if I should do this, and I can't find a scripture that says, thou shalt not blank. What do you do? I got four things for you. Let's take them one at a time. Number one, we go to God. The, the very first thing, when there's something that you're, you're confused about or need help with, we pray. Prayer needs to be our first response, not our last resort, okay? Prayer is not our Hail Mary, Prayer is, and I meant that in like the football terminology, not like Catholic Church, Hail Mary. Um, prayer should, should not be our emergency button. Okay? Prayer is our first response. Before, look, why would you go to anyone or anything else before going to the one who created everything? Like, like if you need help in your walk with God, how about you go to the one you're walking with? Okay? So we go to God first with those questions. Number two, we go to the Bible. And some of you are like, time out. You just told me that this is how I handle things that aren't in the Bible. So how do I go to the Bible about stuff that's not in the Bible? And the answer to that is that just because the Bible doesn't talk about something by name or something directly doesn't mean that there aren't scriptures that still apply to it. There are what we would call parallel scriptures. It it may not say that thing, but it says something about that category of things. Right? Or there's a parallel scripture, or you could say it like this. There are principles in scripture that apply to things that the Bible doesn't really talk about because of when it was written. The right? Bible doesn't talk about speeding because there were no cars. But the Bible does talk about obeying the law of the land. Parallel scriptures. I'm going to give you some of my favorite principle scriptures in just a moment, but I want to give you the other two points first. So number three, after you've gone to God and you've gone to the Bible, go to your life group. Like, the Bible says that in the multitude of counsel, there's safety, right? And so if you need help navigating parts of your life that the Bible is a little bit quiet on, or you need help finding some of those principal scriptures, go to your life group. And and, and life groups relaunch in in one week, next week. And and I encourage every single person, you need to be a part of a group. And and here's the thing, this summer season for life groups, it's a heavy emphasis on social like, it's a heavy emphasis on doing meals together and hanging out and going to games, playing stuff at your house, like, doing stuff that's enjoyable. But 
do not think for a second that just because the group is about fun over the summer, that this point can't happen. My wife and I, our group, we've led it for what, three, four years now, I think, and it is essentially just a social group all the time. Like, we forget to pray most of the time. It's really bad. Like, I, I need help in my life group. Um, but we, we typically, we'll, we'll have a meal together with some families. We'll play a game together. We'll, we'll be in the middle of laughing and, and rejoicing and enjoying the fact that the men have won the game again because we just, we're just on this winning streak just all the time. Uh, and so uh, we'll be in the middle of just enjoying all of that, and then somebody will be like, you know what? I had somebody ask me this question this week, and I didn't know how to answer it. What do you guys think? Or, or I was reading my Bible, and, and there was this, I had this question about what I was reading. It didn't, it didn't quite make sense. And, and in just one conversation, all of a sudden, it just opens up this door where we have an amazing discussion about life and faith and our spiritual journey right after playing a game. Well, pizza still hanging around the house. So don't underestimate the, the power of even a social group to be able to give you direction for your life. And then, number four, go to your pastor. Go to, the, go to God, go to the Bible, go to your life group, go to your pastor, because pastors are supposed to be shepherds. We're, we're here to guide the sheep. That's, that is the purpose of pastors. And, and I counted, and it's crazy. CLC actually has 21 pastors. That's a lot of pastors, right? And that's what we're here for, to help guide you on your faith journey. So in the lobby, stop Pastor Moy and ask him a question. In the West Campus, stop Pastor James or Kiki and ask them a question. Uh, you, can, you can stop Pastor Jason. You can... Talk to Pastor Harry or Crystal. You can talk to Pastor Soul, right? You can even talk to me. Like, seriously, you can talk to me. I know I talk about how I'm an introvert, and some of you avoid me like I'm diseased or something because of it. But, like, it's okay. You can come talk to me, or you can email me. That's even better. Uh, <laughs> Brent at clc.tv, in case you're wondering. Uh, but, no, no like, I, I legitimately, I would love to talk with you and help you navigate this, this Christian life. But can I, can I maybe save both of us a little bit of time? Uh, because what I'm going to do when you come to me with a question is I'm just going to redirect you to a, a scripture in the Bible. Like I'm, I'm just going to redirect you to a principal scripture because what God has to say about the thing in your life is w infinitely more important than what Brent has to say about that thing in your life. It's just, that's just how I roll. That's just how I feel. And so when you come to me, and I'm going to give you my, my principal scriptures right now, but when you come to me, you say, Pastor Brent, hey, can I, and then you fill in the blank, can I watch this show? Can I play this game? Can I go to this club? Can I listen to that song? I'm going to listen to you, and then I'm going to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians 6, 12 that says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything, right? And there are some things in life that abstinence is the only option. It's like, that is sin. You need to avoid it. Stay away from it. But then there's other stuff in our lives that it's not about abstinence. It's about moderation, right? And the question that you have to ask based on the scripture is, A, is it good for you? Because if you're asking me if you can do something and it ain't good for you, then no, don't do it. Could you become a slave to it? Could, it? could it start to control your life? Because the truth is, you can become addicted to way more than just drugs and alcohol. Right. I got a friend who got addicted to golf. Golf was ruining his family because every waking moment, every extra dollar, every weekend was spent golfing, thinking about golf, buying golf stuff, watching golf videos, talking to somebody about golf. And I'm hurting a lot of men in the room right now. I apologize. But he became a slave to golf. For me personally, here's, here's my, my weak spot. I love video games. Like, video games and Jurassic Park. Like, aren't you so glad that you are at a church where that's the pastor, right? Uh, but I, I noticed there have been times in my life when I turned on my PlayStation before I opened my Bible. And it was like, Brent, watch out. Don't become a slave to anything. Or you come to me and you say, Pastor Brent, should I buy that house? Should I, I, I take that job? Should I go to that school? Should I date that boy? Should I do these things? And I'm going to turn your attention to Proverbs 3, 6 that says, with every step you take, think about what he wants, right? Every step, not just the big steps, 
not just the important steps, not just the steps that you're not really certain about, but with every step you take, think about what he wants, and he will help you go the right way. And with this, the question is, have you asked God yet? When, when you come to ask me the question, have you asked God about that yet? And if he said no, then why are you trying to get a second opinion? Okay. Second thing is, does it go against any other scriptures? Right? It may, the, the question you're asking, should I buy this house or should I date this boy? Maybe the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not date that guy. But the Bible does say, don't be unequally yoked. Right? And there's a danger in a Christian and a non-Christian getting together. There, there's, there's danger in that. And so, you got to ask that question. If, if it's about taking a job, will the job compromise you in any way? Like, will you have to lie, cheat, and steal to go up in the ranks in that job? Because that violates other scripture. And so you need to listen to scripture. But if it doesn't violate any scripture, and you went to God, and God was just silent about the issue, then here's the answer. Maybe God is just saying, it doesn't matter. Like, maybe God's just saying, look, you choose option A, I'm going to bless you. You choose option B, I'm going to bless you. Because it's not about the options, it's about you, and I'm going to bless you when you come and when you go. And I'm going to bless you in this, or I'll bless you in that. And we have to understand that God is big enough, and God is good enough, and God is powerful enough to close a door you shouldn't be walking through if you ask him. But if you ask him and he closes the door, stop trying to pick the lock or kick it down, okay? <laughs> Trust the process. Or if you come to me and you say, Pastor, what about, and then insert sexual question. Like, we're totally getting married eventually, so it's fine, right? I'm being vague on purpose because it's Family Sunday. We have children in the room, but I will still turn your attention to Matthew 5, 28. This is Jesus' words. He says, I tell you that if a man looks at a woman and wants to sin sexually with her, he has already committed that sin with her in his mind. And there are a lot of principal scriptures that we could use for this subject. But like I said, it's Family Sunday. So I'm just going to say, Jesus took a pretty hard stance on all of those issues. And he doesn't leave room for you to mess around. And so if it's sexual and it's not with your current spouse, shut it down. Just cut it out. Just don't do it. Okay? Simple answer. Save somebody a lot of time just then. Okay? Or if you come to me and you say, Pastor, what about a little bit of, you know, like the recreational use? Uh, what about a little bit of weed? What about some alcohol? What about some shrooms? What about some prescription drugs that maybe weren't prescribed to me? Like, I mean, the Bible doesn't say don't smoke weed, and Illinois made it legal, so weed's cool, right? Parallel scripture. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober-minded. Other translations say, be clear-headed. Be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And alcohol and drugs, man, they can set you up to fall. And I've seen too many marriages destroyed, too many lives ruined, too many ministries closed down, too many opportunities to be a witness flushed down the toilet, all because a Christian didn't stay sober-minded. And the devil is looking for a way to make you fall. So stop making it easy on him. Amen. Pastor Chris is with me. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> if you come to me and you say, Pastor, this is my last one. Pastor, what about, what about, what about? Like, man, I just, what, what about this? What about that? I, I, I really, it's fun. I, I enjoy it. What, what, what about, what about, what about? I'm just going to turn you to one last scripture. Ephesians 4.22, one of my favorites, says, You were taught to leave your old self. This means you must stop living the evil way that you lived before, right? There's a before Christ and an after Christ. And if you look the same in both zones, something's wrong. That old self gets worse and worse because people are fooled by the evil they want to do, right? Look, sin is fun for a time. And if it's not, you're probably doing it wrong. But it's fun fooling you okay you're being drawn to something that is foolish it's the evil that your your flesh wants to do but 
You must be made new in your hearts, your passions, your desires, in your thinking, the stuff that you're dwelling on, the stuff you're focused on. Be that new person who was made to be like God, truly good and pleasing to him. For Christians, our old life is dead and buried. We are a new creation, and it's not about that old life anymore. And if there's anything in your life right now that is, that is not pleasing to him, why are you playing those games? I'd love for you to kind of take a, a moment to kind of self-reflect. Because maybe for some of you, there's, there's some stuff that wasn't an issue for you in the past. But now, now you're trying to be that new person. Now you've got a family. Now you've stepped into a call that God has on your life. Now you've been given influence. Now you've been placed in a position of authority and stuff that was okay for you to do in the past, it isn't part of that new creation that God's made you to be. And maybe it's time to just reevaluate some stuff in your life that isn't even sinful. It's just not beneficial in your life anymore. It's, it's no longer helping you get closer to God. Because I'm convinced that there are two ways that a Christian can live their life. A Christian can live their life saying, how close to the line can I get? If, if this is the line, and if, and if I cross this line, it's sin, how close to that can I get before I make God upset? If, if sex is the sin, what can I do with my girlfriend that isn't? If, if getting drunk is the sin, then how many drinks can I have before it's sinful? How, how close, can, can, I, can my toes cross over the line and still be okay? Like can, I, can I dangle one foot over the line and just kind of try and balance? Is that okay? How, how close to the line can I get? Or, as a Christian, you can live your life asking, how close to God can I get? And here's the thing, you can't do both. Because God doesn't hang out by the line. And you can be as close to God as you want to be. He's not the obstacle. He, he says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. He says, knock and I'll open the door. He says, seek and you'll find. Like if you're coming for me, you're going to find me. And you can be as close to me as you want to be. But as long as you're just trying to find where the line is, you're heading in the wrong direction. I heard a story uh, about a rich guy who was trying to hire a driver for his family. So he had this kind of audition, this kind of job interview. It was a little bit extreme. He, he took them to this cliff, and he had them drive their cars. He said, I want you to drive and see how close to the, the, the cliff you can get without going over. Like, I want to see your skills in action, see if you're good enough to drive my family. And it was like driver after driver, man, they were impressive. I mean, they could stop on a dime, like right on the edge of the curb, I mean, uh, of the cliff. I mean, some, some of these drivers even got like one tire kind of hanging over the edge, but the car was still balanced. It was, it was impressive driving, let me tell you. And then there was one driver, got in his car, and just backed it up. <laughs> he was like, it's already close enough to that cliff. And the rich guy came up to him and said, you're hired. Because if I'm going to put the safety of my family in your hands, I don't want you flirting with the cliff. And what if God looks at us the same way? And he's saying, guys, I don't want you flirting with sin. I don't want you flirting with the line. I don't want you trying to see how close you can get and still say, stay saved. I want you to get as close to me as possible. So how are you living your life? Are you trying to find where the line is? Or are you trying to find where God is? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you because you are holy and good and amazing. And Father, that even in our weaknesses, even in, in our moments of sin and and even if, if we've been living life on the edge, close to that line, your forgiveness and your grace is here today to draw us back to you. So, Father, we just thank you right now for the God of second chances. And Father, I pray right now for every single person in the room that is declaring today, I'm going to stop looking for the line and I'm going to start looking for God. I pray that you would meet them where they are and help them take those next steps towards you. Before we close, you, you may be in this room or you may be online right now and, and you've been 
not living looking for the line. You've just been living in sin, just straight up. Maybe it's because you've never heard a preacher lay it out like this before, or maybe you have and you've just been in rebellion against it. The absolute that is so vital to us is salvation. It's this idea that, that yes, we are sinful, and because of our sin, we're separated from God. But God loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die for us so that he could bridge that gap between us and him, so that he could draw us back to him, so he could give us the opportunity to be right with him. And then that, that absolute about salvation says that if, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the free gift of salvation. And if you're here today and you need to receive that gift, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Get my attention. If you're here today and you need salvation, you need Jesus in your life, wave at me. Wherever you are in the room or online. I'm going to have you repeat this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of all my sins, of all the times I try to do things my way. I want to be right with you. I want to know you. So today, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I believe that because you were raised to life, I'll be raised as well. Jesus, thank you for making me new today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hey, I'm excited for those of you that prayed that prayer. <laughs> Pastor Jerry's gonna come in a moment. He's gonna give you instructions. Actually, I, I can do that right now. Look, if you prayed that prayer, grab your cell phone, text the word LIFE to 833-420-1244. If you're online, you can do the same thing or just let them know in the chat that you prayed that prayer because we want to help you walk this decision out, man. There, there's some resources we want to give you. We want to get you baptized. We want, to, we want to help you understand what it means to live the Christian life and how to get as close to God as you can. And, and we've just got some resources that we want to give to you and, and, and a conversation we want to start with you to help you through that. Uh, so text the word LIFE to 833-420-1244. Uh, and I'm going to invite everybody to go ahead and stand. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. We're going to close out this service with a moment of worship.